Paul, um, I was just thinking to start things off that uh, about this text that Raphael Rubinstein wrote in 1991 about your work, and he called it The Survival of Pagan Geometry. I thought it was a very interesting title, and I'm wondering how you react to this title. What does pagan geometry mean for you? Is it, does it resonate as something that you're involved with? Um, in, uh, in the early 90s, there was a very strong kind of earth relationship to my work and I, in a way the pagan comes out of the earth like there's a relationship to the moon and the sun and the growth of things mm -hmm. and the forms are very quite well quite large and so a lot of my work came out of these structures of squares that went together mm -hmm. and slowly it, it evolved from this pagan kind of very earth-like earth pa um, painting into but keeping keeping on to the um, how forms uh, are not like this i don't pick one form in a painting i don't have a logo for my for my work i don't kind of represent myself through one necessary structure or one geometric structure, but I bring in multiple geometric structures into the work as the painting evolves. Mm -hmm. But somewhere there's, um, you know, geometry can be considered a kind of mathematical practice that brings in absolute, you know, results. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we have absolute shapes. And that's part of the grandeur of geometry. And I think, yeah, in your work, there are things like repeated basic structures like mm. circles, triangles, squares, but they don't build a kind of absolute structure. They, they end up being used for more subjective purposes in your work, right? Yes, I mean, I wouldn't say I'm a geometric painter mm. because you, I, I, don't want to, I don't want my painting to be defined as one specific idea. I'm more interested in the painting as being a painting that comp is comprised of perhaps geometric structures but also comprised of color but it can be the, in the color can be independent of the structure that right. is built is being built on. Right. And um, and there's no the 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 let's say the cabalistic idea or the cabal of of um, mathematics interests me more than let's say a more scientific um, uh, decimal counting from one to a hundred. Mm -hmm. I believe there's more magic in numbers than just um, mm -hmm. a measurement. Right. And the reason I was bringing that in as a, as a kind of introductory idea is that there is this kind of deep, you know, geometric structure, abstract impulse that is basically at work in all of your work, right? And so, you know, it's one way of starting to talk about it, the geometric impulse, the pagan geometry. And as we know, you know, maybe all great paintings have a geometric structure of some sort, even if we don't talk about this anymore uh, much, but it's a long tradition of constructing an image using geometry, geometric principles, I'd say. So at the same time in your work, there's the the, the, the hand and the line as, as such, as a kind of sensitive um, element that comes back in different forms in all your work. Um, um, so that's, yeah, that was the way I wanted to start. And then I would say also that your paintings embrace, confidently embrace, the, uh, some of the great achievements of modernist painting, you know, um, and such as, you know, the flatness of the picture plane, the diagram, you know, um, the material as subject. Um, but again, not in this kind of absolute embrace or not in the sense of those achievements being absolute. Like in many of the modernist paintings, they had this objective um, quality and they were achieved as an objective, these, these, these principles, these formal principles. In your work, there's this kind of both an embrace but a subtle deflation of some of these absolute um, uh, achievements. And I would say in the name of what? I would say in the name of something like the subjective or like mm -hmm. the subjectivity of the <clears throat> artist. Um, <clears throat> so is that 
something you agree <coughs> with? Is that something that you uh, are actually consciously doing? Um, um, up to the late 90s, my whole idea was to stick to the modernist trope of the flat picture plane. Mm -hmm. And it could only be like a quarter of an inch deep, visually quarter of an inch deep. There could be profiles and frontal pictures, but nothing that could involve uh, a picture within the picture. And off, in 1999, I started introducing perspectival lines and realized I could, fr I could actually abandon this modernist idea of the flat picture. Mm -hmm. And with, the, with that, I started deciding that the painting could also be about image, and, but you don't have, it doesn't have to be a narrative image. It just suggests an image. But that is contained within the painting. It, it, the painting isn't about image. It is part of painting for me. Mm -hmm. And in, in that way, I liberated myself of, of, of this very heavy baggage that modernism had kind of imposed or that I was trying to deal with, deal with or follow. And then I could come back to the flat picture plane, mm. like saying, okay, this painting may seem to have an illusion in it, but it refuses the illusion that it is proposing. So, I, so then I was allowed to bring in the idea of contradiction within the painting. Mm -hmm. So the painting could contradict itself, not because I wanted the painting to, to have this kind of negative contradiction, but more that it allows you to start not so that the viewer can not necessarily stay on one part of the painting, but go through the painting in, many, in its many different aspects. Mm -hmm. That he, 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 uh, the, the, they could see in the painting something and then leave it. So the, I'm not, I was no longer afraid that the viewer could see something in the painting. Mm -hmm. Before I would refuse anything. Mm -hmm. I would say, no, you're not allowed to see this. It's, it is about painting, you should only see painting. Mm -hmm. But painting does, as I said before, painting does contain image. So you should allow this natural instinct of the human being to see things, because that's how we are made, mm -hmm. but not allow the viewer to stay with that one thing they see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, that brings in the, uh, this idea of design and how, you know, especially today, everything is designed on, in, you know, digital software. Uh, and then you could say that a lot of if there is anything that remains that can be called abstract painting, that a lot of the things uh, that can be named that are basically trans, you know, translations of design onto canvas. And I think your work is very much not design, even though there's, of course, a design element, but they're more like, you know, constructions in time. And I think you feel that quality. Um, so, yeah, that again is a kind of non-absolute situation and it's about a deflation of this idea of design as this kind of complete thing. Um, so yeah, the counterforce is also at work in this, this idea of design and not design. Yeah. Well, yeah, because what I, I learned from the more, the more paintings or the, in southern Spain in the Halombra, which where the, the walls are wall designs, but the designs were for the, the lines were used not for design but for other other um, like the lines would be going on into infinity, but the the lines that were painted onto the walls, which were multiple colours, would actually represent flowers, but the flowers had nothing to do with the lines. So I so they would go beyond the limit of the picture frame. Mm -hmm. And I started getting rid of the totemic forms in my painting when I started realizing that the line could be used differently. Mm -hmm. Of course, that may bring in issues of design, but design as out of that understanding that these structures create other forms, mm -hmm. then it, that answers the... Yeah. So if, if I use a, when I bring in a circle in the painting, it came out of another painting that I made before, that I developed, and, it, and, and what I was in, I'm more interested in is that these elements I bring along in my work, which are multiple elements, 
they continue evolving. They don't. Mm -hmm. they don't they're not static right. forms. They're right. evolving forms. Right, right. That's what we were talking about. Yeah. Um, and I guess this this other thing which distinguishes these paintings and gives them their kind of weight or gravitas is the sense of how they produce an experience of time, you know, and that both reflects the time that it takes to make them, but also, um, you know, this idea that um, each surface is, is produced in, in, within a kind of different differential. They're all different. They, they, each surface has a different tone, a different, um, you know, uh, finish quality. Uh, they're matte sometimes, sometimes they're glossy, you know, depending on what the color is supposed to do. So, yeah, there is this sense of time and there's also this other idea which is the, or, or you know, re, uh, result, which is they emanate a kind of unusual luminosity. All your paintings have a lu an internal luminosity, which is, I think, very rare today. And that also suggests a sense of time, I think. So, is that something you're thinking about, luminosity? Um, or? <clears throat> oh, yes. Um, I, I want my, I, I've always thought, I, I've always strived for my work to deal with layered time. So there, uh, there's a layer, like in cinema, you start with a, you start with a beginning, beginning and you have an end, and that's the time you sit through a film. Mm -hmm. uh, a painting is usually a layered time because it is when you're in front of it, the time layers on top of it instead of uh, you don't see the painting moving, but the time still is, is, is there. It comes from within. Within, but yeah. I also have a feeling that painting is about suspended time, because mm -hmm. you, 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 in film it's not suspended because you're going through the film, while, or music, which is a linear time also, in painting is a suspended time, that you're, you, time is forgotten when you're in front of a painting, and the more it's forgotten, the, the longer you can stay with the painting. Mm -hmm. And the painting echoes even after you've even after you've seen it, for me, I, I'm interested in how the painting can echo in your mind for, for also a long period of time. And you can come back to the painting, and we see it, and we see the painting again. Um, also, the idea of the time it is made and the time that is seen, is also, and the time you, you, you embrace the object, and the time you discover new elements in the painting. A bit like in what Edmond Jabez talks about is the desert rose, which has many different facets mm -hmm. that you can, a painting opens up when you look at it. Mm -hmm. it you, you discover more and more elements in it, but even if the painting is very simple or very straightforward, there are things in it that are, that are necessary, that become, that are necessarily, um, how do you say it? Um, you wouldn't have expected to have seen in, first of all, that you discover over time. Mm -hmm. There's another thing which is, I think, uh, been going on progressively over many years is this, uh, it's also a classical theme, right? This idea of um, paintings are great at getting more and more simplified into, you know, line and field of color. Um, there's also a diagrammatic element to the work, which is, again, not an absolute, that there's no painting is not just a diagram of itself, like it could be in modernism, you know, or in other uh, ways of thinking. It's, it's a diagrammatic project, but it's also just a simple, you know, act of drawing in, into a field of color or a field of color coming to support a, a yeah, linear I'm not, I'm structure. Not sure. yeah. And so, you know, Olivier Caplan, the French critic, he, he, he described the work as very beautifully as a um, mental architecture looking for space. I mean, I translate, you know, I paraphrase. And I think that's, that's true also. There's this kind of idea of thinking and then this idea of thinking through drawing mm -hmm. and, then, and then, you know, producing space in some way. So there's this reductive vocabulary we, or, you know, that's developed over many years. <clears throat> and this is what we get, you know, lines and fields of color. So maybe talk to us about this, this process, maybe how you got to this point, because that's very different from your drawings in which, you know, you really kind of work things out and kind of freehand and all kinds of complexities and densities can happen. Uh, and how in the paintings, it, there's a kind of simplification 
of some of these kind of turbulent qualities that the drawings have? Um, I was never a big fan of, as much as I'm a big fan of Baroque music, uh, uh, Rubens was, I, I didn't, although the reds in Rubens' shadows are fantastic, I was more attuned to painters like Vermeer, um, even Titian, who are much more, who are, are simpler, they don't over, overstate the picture. And for me, I believe that this is not, the, simple, is the simpler you get, the more complex it can become. Because if you go into a painting that's super complex and you see it's complex, then you can say, okay, it's a complex painting. So of course you can see many things in it, but a simpler painting. So when I got to this um, idea of breaking down the painting to just two colors, a field and a figure, or a figure and a field, it wishes, wishes figure, wishes field, and, um, and we, I started from there. I, I, I completely um, shed, shred my painting of any superfluous uh, entity. Mm -hmm. And then I built on that, and allowing my things that, and then I can start allowing in my painting elements that I wouldn't have allowed before. Mm -hmm. And those elements become important because as soon as you make one gesture in a very simplified field, field that gesture becomes enormous. Amplified. Yeah. It's amplified mm -hmm. because it's, you suddenly see it. Mm -hmm. it's, well, oh, wow, that's, that, thing, that is in there like a tail drop. Mm -hmm. This drop form came in. It, was, it seemed to be not my vocabulary, but how, did, how could I bring it into my vocabulary? Mm -hmm. But that could be also considered a, 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 a classical modernist, you know, uh, uh, ambition to simplify it, to reduce to kind of essential elements. But at the same time, that's not really what's going on either, because, you know, this is not minimalist painting, even though it might feel sometimes that that's the kind of language it is operating in. It's also uh, not that at all, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you look no. at this red painting and these these crazy lines are expressive, you know, they're not about some essential shape that you're getting at. It's, um, so yeah, these, again, this kind of affirmation and deaffirmation uh, is, is, is going on all the time. Because I want, I want, <clears throat> what I want the viewer to, to leave with is the notion of painting. They, they, they looked at a the painting, they, they, they leave with a the painting, they leave, in their mind, they, they, they leave with this, uh, in the end, I, I was brought up in painting. I lived, I've been living in painting since a young child and looking at uh, going to museums since age of four. So uh, somehow my whole, my whole uh, life has been working, around, working with what painting is for me. Like, yeah. is painting about air? Is painting about an object? Is painting about line? Is painting about color? How do all these elements how can all these elements be part of one painting without them being ever the most important element of the painting? Mm. So the most important element of the painting is actually the painting itself, not these different entities mm -hmm. that are in it. But, you know, we could also say that in today's painting world, all kinds of new techniques and, uh, you know, um, materials have been introduced, like digital printing, mm. like, you know, most paintings have a photographic element or some kind of collage element. Uh, all of that you've kind of kept out. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you still are making, you're, ma you're almost like an engineer or like a craftsman, you're staying with the very traditional elements, the material elements that, uh, which is oil on canvas, <laughs> uh, uh, which are, you know, what people define, define painting as for, for centuries. Mm -hmm. So you, you kept out all these like external new techniques, new mediums that are now maybe contaminating or coming into the world of painting. And so how do you, how do you react to that? What, what makes you uh, stay with these fundamental, you know, <coughs> materials and, and, and compositional attitude? Um, uh, well, those, those elements came into painting through cubism, I suppose, mm. uh, the idea of collage and, mm. and this kind of bring in, paint, bring in pop. I mean, color, cubism was the first pop art in mm -hmm. a certain way because they're using pop mm -hmm. elements, popular elements. But I wanted to not allow my painting to be distracted. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, 
there's a lot of artists here. They do multimedia art and they paint, they make films, they do many different things, they make sculpture. I mean, okay, yes, that's good, but I feel like it, that was that's too much for me. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, for me to paint is already hard enough mm -hmm. to have to bring in other things into the painting, to, to, to explore one thing, mm -hmm. which is kind of very different from what a lot of artists want to do, because they, they think the, for me, paint, the, for me, the medium, the medium is the language. Mm -hmm. Well, and... And that's a modernist idea too, <laughs> right there, the medium is language, yeah. Mm -hmm. But the thing is like, you know, as Raphael says also in the, in the text he wrote for this show, he says that as opposed to most or many painting, painters who developed in the 80s, like Mary Hellman and I forget who else he, he refers to, but many, many painters who were trying to get away from, let's say, minimalist painting, they started to kind of bring in things like irony or the decorative or pop elements uh, yeah, to con contaminate the, and irony, yeah, irony. Uh, none of this is coming, comes into your painting. There's no irony, there's no decorative, there's no obvious references to, the, to outside elements, there's no pop imagery, and there's no um, ready-made that brought, that's, you know, all these things that have happened. Um, and a part of art. So, yeah, this is very interesting that you just stick to very simple, predefined materials and a certain language that, that has a kind of reductive quality, of course. Um, you stick to it. And this is what people, I think people, you know, feel that. They feel that there's 35, 40 years of painting behind each of these paintings. You know, 40 years of daily practice with these particular fundamental elements only. Yeah, I mean, in, in 1982, we go really far back, I started painting, I, I, I wanted to make punk paintings, or punk, punk art. And then I realized that it was, it wasn't, had nothing to do with what I was making in the end. So I decided to, to throw away everything that could be of the outside, not, I'm not throwing away the outside in my painting, I'm just saying I don't want there to be a reference, direct reference to to, cut to a pop culture, mm -hmm. uh, although there is, I mean, there's a, the painting called In the City is actually a title of In the, by, by The Jam. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a song called In the City. Mm -hmm. But those are more references to, um, to things I have listened to or my youth or something that's got to do with me. Mm -hmm. But it's, no, it's not, the, the title came after the painting was painted. Mm -hmm. um, there are, Mythological titles, they are, uh, and all these paintings, uh, I think for me everything is, because I've seen so much art, I don't see any superior art from another art mm -hmm. in, 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 vi in visual art. Um, recently I was talking to a painter friend and I said we were talking about cave painting. Mm -hmm. I mean that's great painting. And we, 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 we're bringing on, we're continuing in that 40,000, 50,000 year tradition of Homo sapiens, sapiens painting. Mm. And we seem to forget that that's where it all started. Mm -hmm. And um, so if one puts it too much into a specific time frame, you lose all the other time frame. Mm -hmm. um, I think it isn't linear, I think it's circular. We, we, we live, we, we're still in this big great lake. We have, with the cave painters, with Titian, with the Chinese painters, mm -hmm. Shi Chi Tao, mm -hmm. the a African artists, mm -hmm. we're all in this big lake of making objects, making art, and um, that all all that art nourishes me because we're, I'm, I'm, well, I feel like we're we're we're, they're they're our grandfathers, our brothers, our, they're they're part of the our sisters and mothers. I mean the mother tongue. Um, it's part of my work. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that kind of makes sense, but one forgets, one has to forget art history, but one, one can allow it to be part of your work. Mm -hmm. Not art his, the, uh, the idea of history is wrong, mm -hmm. that you, you call it history. It's all living still. Mm -hmm. Right, it's all living, but it's not a, you don't deal with the ready-made or appropriation or things like this, all, all these things are kept out, they have yeah. come in. Uh, I mean, I kept out Duchamp, mm -hmm. 
I, kept, I loved Duchamp, and I kept out Duchamp, and I've looked at Duchamp, but I looked at Duchamp who looked at uh, Leonardo da Vinci, mm -hmm. and I looked at Leonardo da Vinci also. Mm -hmm. And I love Leonardo da Vinci, I love Marcel Duchamp. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't want to use that. Mm -hmm. I could have gone there, mm -hmm. but I didn't. Yeah, uh, really. <laughs> uh, I didn't want to go there. I, I, I've always felt, I, use, I always felt like painting was in my veins, mm -hmm. that that is what I, I am. Mm -hmm. I'm, not a, I'm not a sculptor. I don't want to Maybe these lines are kind of like veins. We never even thought about that. <laughs> uh, I remember once jokingly in a party in the, in, the Nazi, in, the, in the 90s, I said that I had oil paint in my veins. <laughs> that I, 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 was, I fell into a pot of oil paint and I never got out of it. <laughs> but there's something, you know, this is why I think in particular right now, to show these paintings and to do this show, there's something which is you know, which you don't find in much art, which is that there's almost an unquestionable kind of quality or necessity, the sense of that these paintings, you know, are just, they come from something deep, from your desire and your makeup, and that they have to happen. These paintings have to happen as they happen. And that's the kind of trust that they, they, they produce, or at least I feel I can trust them in that sense, you know, and so this idea of all these years of painting unquestionably uh, you and your studio more or less alone you know with a few friends and never questioning the the fact that you're doing this right so this is something that very few artists produce as a, as a sensation you know I think these paintings have that in them um, and I think um, that's a, a, something I, I hope people will feel you know when they look at each, each painting and, and as Rafael Rubinstein also says, there is a very consistent variety. You know, each, each painting is a different thing. There's no prescribed solution. It's a reductive language, but each painting is its own, um, its own composition, its own, its own world. Um, that's why it's so nice to have a chance to see them next to each other and to install them and have them find their space or their position within the installation. Uh, it has been it, did, it, was, it was both easy and difficult because they all speak to each other, but they can't be necessary, you know, some of them can't be next to others, you know, and so... Yeah, they, some, yeah. some of them don't like each other. Yeah, or, or they, uh, they, they, they can, cancel or, each or other. They cancel or, each other out. Yeah, yeah. Every, for me, every painting has to... It starts out with a set of questions which never really are completely answered. And I try and get, I try and evolve these questions, or let's say these pictorial questions, I have to take them to a certain place. And when I arrive at that place, the painting is, is what can say, at that point, left alone. Mm -hmm. And it, it talks for itself. It goes beyond the questions I gave it. Mm -hmm. I always want a painting to go beyond what I expect of it. Mm -hmm. So that it, if I know what it's going to, if I know how the painting is, when it, how the painting will be when it's finished, why, why am I going to be painting it? Right. Because I already know what it's going to look like. I don't want to know what my painting is going to look like when it's finished. Mm. It, it, it yeah. has to go beyond what it, yeah. what I expect it's going to look like. And that's what the magical painting is. I want when a viewer is in front of a painting to, to, to not know the painting when he walks in. Right. And that, but that's also a traditional idea of art as being bigger than itself. You know, Frank Stella said, what you see is what you get. There's no outside, you know? So I think you both say what you see is what you get, but there's still, you know, maybe an outside that's kind of trying to be captured in some minor way, right? Uh, each painting has, I think, that question built into it. Uh, and there's only one that's completely self-contained, literally, which is this one there. Um, all the others have lines that go out or... On this one? And this one. Oh, no, it goes out, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, there's also... Uh, when, when the outside world is the viewer, so what I also want is that the space between the view and the painting. Um, uh, one, of, one of my greatest pleasures in, in looking at painting was to be far from it and see how, how the painting looked far away and then going up to very close and seeing how it complete, what I saw from far away totally changed into something completely abstract. The space between the viewer and the painting, the space, the air between 
Because it's not an image, it's an object in a certain way. So I'm interested also in the problematic of the air between, like between me and Miguel, there's this space between us, this air. And the painting also has that relationship to the body. The body, you, we go, like Miguel was talking about the mental space in my paintings. I'm interested in the mental space and the physical space. So that we, they're, 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 they're mental constructs but they're also physical constructs, that the painting itself has this kind of, you, 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 I want people to be aware of the air between you and it. I don't know if that, like in Vermeer, in Vermeer there is, air, he, he's the great, greatest painter of air. When you, look at, when you look at, when I look at Vermeer, I'm aware of the air in which the sitter was sitting. Mm -hmm. And it's not trompe l'oeil, it's just he was so aware of the air in the room the air outside the window, the air, the air in the objects. And I, I feel that that's a very important issue with painting. You have to be, uh, for me, I really want you to be aware that, there, that there's air between you and the painting. But what you say also is a contradiction, right? Because when you, when you talk about Vermeer, he's always discussed as an absorbative painter, right? And you could say that modernist painting is, is the wall, it pushes you back, right? So again, it's a contradiction between what you do and what you're looking at or thinking about. Uh, so how could a modernist painting a wall be absorbing, you know, in the sense of bringing you in uh, or asking you to come in, right? So these are very subtle issues that I think you work with very well. Um, and Piet Mondrian and Vermeer are very close. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. I mean, they're from the same place. They're the same place, yes. But they're actually, they're, they're, Piet Mondrian wrongly is considered a painter of objects, although he wanted his paintings to be object. Mm. He is actually dealing with air. He's mm. dealing with the refusal of air and the mm. affirmation of air. Mm. Like he, he said, he once said, I want to break the, I want to break the surface plane. Mm. He wanted to go beyond the surface plane. That's how we got to, to, to Victory Boogie Woogie and Mm -hmm. uh, because then he began to create these different spaces within his painting. Mm -hmm. And if he hadn't died at the age of 70 something, he may say he would have actually, I, I wonder what he would have done afterwards. Mm -hmm. Maybe he would have done installation of, maybe he, because... He had maybe a few more of these boogie boogies in him. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now we're in the small gallery where drawings are being shown. Mm -hmm. And I thought it'd be nice to hear you Distinguish what you do when you draw as opposed to paint to start with. I mean, there's many, many drawings in your practice. You've, I mean, thousands of drawings. Um, in this room, there's a number who have, that were made the same day, more or less the same day. So yeah, maybe tell us how you, how you work on paper as opposed to canvas. <clears throat> um, I, they, they, it's, it's a sim simultaneous uh, practice. Um, and sometimes I kind of relax my painting and I go into drawing and I can do a whole, a whole day of drawing or a couple of hours of drawing working on, on these uh, smaller formats that kind of take me away from, from the painting. But also drawing is not the... Most of my drawings um, are not uh, studies for my, for my paintings. They're not, it's more or less a parallel... A, Activity. Activity. And both the painting nourishes the drawing, and the drawing, I mean, if we can call them drawings, but let's say works on paper, nourish the paintings. Because um, certain elements in the works on paper transfer onto the paintings, but certain elements in the paintings transfer back into the drawings. Mm. Um, the, the drawing also is... Um, they're faster, of course, because one can't load too much material onto a drawing or onto paper before it completely collapses. But I, you, I, here I, I, I don't uh, restrict myself to one material, like oil. I, they're, they're, they're made with ink, ballpoint, uh, uh, pencil. H, H, H pencil, uh, HB pencils, but mainly 8H, 8H, 7H, um, uh, gouache, watercolor, oil pastel, dry pa uh, soft pastel, ink. Um, uh, and I kind of 
in each element, the graphite, and each, each element for me has a different light reflection and different body to them, and um, that's the material side. Also, the draw most of my drawings recently have all been the same size, which is uh, 15 by 11 inches, which is a funny kind of constraint. I, I tear up a large sheet of paper into four, so they're never completely straight, but I deal with one format. I mean, I, mean, I have over the last uh, six, six, seven years mainly dealing with this one format. From time to time, I may, I've been making much larger drawings, drawings that are, uh, um, what is that, in, in, uh, no, I know it in um, centimeters. In centimeters, which is 70 centimeters by 100, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, three feet by uh, four foot, approximately. And, but the energy I wanted in these drawings was an, in, 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 an immediate energy, but which could be seen uh, like, because I'm always very interested in how the body is and how the body reflects or goes with the work and how the body can, you lose the size of the, the work. They become bigger than they appear. One of the things you tell me sometimes when we talk about your drawings is that one of the things you're after is not to repeat yourself, is to try to be as intuitive and maybe subconscious as possible and also have this kind of goal not to repeat yourself. Is that, is That's that true? That's true, yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I don't want to repeat myself. I mean, I don't want to make two, two, two drawings the same. I, mm -hmm. I can't do... I, uh, a bit like the paintings, but the paintings takes out, uh, go, but the, when you do 10 drawings in a day or 20 drawings in a day, uh, I, I want the drawing to not, I, I want there to be an evolution of the language, not a repetition of the language. Right, but that's not easy to do when you have such a reductive, you know, simplified vocabulary. Um, so after all these years and all these thousands of drawings, it must be, yeah, more and more difficult maybe to achieve this, this openness and uh, this, uh, it, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, that's why I, I date them on the front because I, I'm, I'm curious to go back later and look at the drawings I made in 2015 and the drawings I make now and the choices I made then and the choices I make now, the color choices, the, the space choices. I sometimes realize I, I, I get stuck in one specific type of space in the drawing and I try and break that so that it, it, it becomes, so it opens up again. Mm -hmm. So the drawing is kind of opening up to something I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, what is the relationship between idea and action, you know, in painting, uh, sorry, in drawing, but also how is that different from, from painting? Because obviously in painting, the idea has to be more established ahead of time maybe in some ways and in drawing maybe less so there's maybe more this kind of immediacy and unknown balance between idea and execution and action right uh, in in drawing it's um because it's so fast the idea happens and then you have to be extremely fast on knowing what you're going to do with that idea when you're putting the i put the mark down and the idea evolves when i put the mark down mm -hmm. In a painting, I set up a structure on the painting and then the idea, and then it evolves very slowly. So this, the speed is very different. Mm. Uh, I went to see the Joe Mitchell show and In there, Paris. Yeah, and there the idea is immediate. She, she attacks a painting and she goes with it and she allows the intuitive to, to function even if she's trying to, even if she is, has a pre, predetermined sometimes idea in her, her work. In, in my painting, I, it's more about this layering, as we were talking before, the layering of time and the layering of, and the, the slow changing of the painting. While in drawing, it's a very quick change. It, it can be one thing, one second, and then I can throw it in the bathtub and everything disappears nearly, and then I come back and I work in a wet piece of paper and then I, I put dry pasta on it, which kind of dissolves into the water, and then I may throw it back into the bathtub and bring it bathtub. out. Bathtub? Oh, 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 yeah, wherever. <laughs> they take a bath? Well, drinks, or, okay. well, they do sometimes. <laughs> I mean, this one, for example, I threw it uh -huh. into, uh, into the bathtub. 
or, or sink or the sink and right. I worked in the wet. Um, well, some, some of them take on, um, I think paper is a transparent space, much more than a painting. I think uh, the painting is opaque, that if initially opaque, that you have an object that is affirming its objecthood. The painting affirms its objecthood immediately because of its nature. Well, pa pa and it, it, paper is, only, is, is the opposite. Paper doesn't affirm its objecthood. And it's when you try, do you make it stay opaque, I mean uh, transparent, or do you make it opaque? How, how do you deal with the paper? Mm -hmm. um, it, it is, are you into a, a space that can go on forever, or are, you into, or are you looking at a wall? Or a flat surface, yeah. Or a flat surface. Say more about what you mean by transparent quality of, of drawing and paper. Um, because, it, because for me, paper, even if I choose specifically types of paper I use, uh, sometimes very, very soft, sometimes, the rougher the paper, the more less translucent it is, because it's becoming more of an object, is that when you put a line down, you're defining, maybe it's because I come out of, I mean, I looked at too much of Leonardo, at Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo drawings, is that there's so much space in the paper. The paper is, is infinity. Hmm. It's like this kind of void. It's like this space that you can go right into. And how do you deal with when you put a line on it? You're not putting a line. You're nearly drawing in, you're nearly drawing in space. Hmm. Interesting. And when I, do cover, uh, when I do cover entirely the sheet of paper, then I can negate that relationship. Hmm to paper as being infinity and you create a new, a new space. Mm. But what, so I'm playing against that, because so, I don't want, so how, how, how much do these elements, where, how deep is the piece of paper when the drawing is finished? Mm. Right. Okay. So I don't have that much more to ask. So I think it's nice to have these thoughts on how you make these drawings, which are a big part of your work. Um, and so I'm happy that we're going to show some and that people can see the, the connection, even though um, this show is very much about large scale paintings. Uh, we hesitated to even include drawings, but uh, this gallery, which is which you can miss, by the way, uh, is uh, I think is a nice space to maybe go in quickly and then, it, then you forget and it's like everything else happens. With but it's a, I think uh, I'm happy that you did include the drawings. Mm -hmm. we, did, we did include the drawings because it uh, enriched each, each uh, picture or process I use, like painting and drawing, both of them enrich, enrich each other. Mm -hmm. um, and somehow it gives this kind of open it op opens up the, the thought process, the right. mental process. I mean, also we could say, you know, to finish that, uh, there's an interesting situation of the drawing, which is traditionally in some, in many cases, you know, considered like a study for something else. And here they're not that, but they're also a little bit that, you know, there are some ideas and some shapes that get translated into some of the paintings. Um, and partly because they're, very simple shapes that you're working with, you know. But there's also um, in many drawing, in many of the drawings, just like you know, the activity of, and, and the and the, we call it the jazz of the drawings, where you see lines moving fast and uh, yeah. As a postscript to uh, our conversation, I thought it'd be a good idea to situate Paul's paintings in the context of today's dominant figurative environment what I could describe as zombie figuration or even disfiguration. I think it's clear and we can feel that these paintings radiate into the world from the perspective of kind of an inner, an inner necessity, um, something which comes with uh, the long experience of the painter working in the studio and showing through the time dimension of their development, the, um, 
that kind of that kind of uh, dimension, which is quite rare today, and it's, I think it a, becomes a counterforce to what we see. Um, and I therefore believe that this is a good time to look at these paintings, and uh, they invite you to look, feel, and perhaps see. <laughs>